kid. He's got you on the ropes. What are you doing? Keep your gaff up and drop that crane. Hey, Cornell, cut him. Cut him. Now look, kid. That bum's coming at you with the same track and shout Wells did, and you're doing all that fancy boon well. He's gonna murder you. And he oughta. No. <coughs> oh, God, this is so painful. <coughs> we want slow, steady. You don't want to get Malik on the guy, or Tarkovsky him, but a little Eastwood, some Riker. Hell, right now you bring a hollow center against that clown and he'll go down like Sylvester Stallone in a comedic role. Now look, you got a heart like Capra and a fist like Friedkin. You keep your eyes open and alert to what's going on, like Burnett, and you're gonna make it. Now get off your weasel and win this thing! You okay, Chris? No. Oh my God. You train for the pod? I don't know. Do you really? Burgess you know? Meredith was able to do that for a whole movie. <laughs> well, why do you think his voice sounded that? <laughs> well, we're here to discuss. This is a movie. It's like not even a movie. It's in the pantheon of pop cultural truth. 40, 50 years on, 100 years on, 200 years on. It's still going to be a thing. It's Rocky. Sylvester Stallone's claim to fame. And we're joined today to discuss Rocky by our friend and colleague, producer, writer, creator, boxer. I just made that up. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see how the we'll see how it goes. goes. Paul Tonelli. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Great to be here. Now, this was your suggestion. Yes. This is, uh, to me, I was thinking about this morning. I thought, I don't remember a time when I didn't remember having seen Rocky. Yeah. I don't remember a first time seeing it. It's just yeah. always been. And Rocky's like, not to get too crazy about, but he is like a real He's person a real person. Yeah, he's yeah. a real person to me. And I say that with confidence and with no. Well, beauty. he's a real person to Sylvester Stallone. I mean, he Sly has this thing where he says Rocky is the one character he has that speaks and talks to him and can say things that he feels he can't say. He did an unfortunate meeting of the two. Have you ever seen that video where he's no. interviewing Rocky? We'll play a little later. Must After we, we give the film some love, <laughs> yeah. we can take a few loving shots exactly. at some of the um I mean, that might be one of the kidneys, but... Rocky was always part of my life. That's it. I always remember watching it constantly. If it was up, any one of them. Okay. If they came on yeah. cable, yeah. I would watch them. The marathons, forget it. I'm done for the day, no matter what part <laughs> I, I check in on. But also that thing of, like you just mentioned about Stallone being so much of a parallel of Rocky or the same person. Yeah. I feel like even when you watch the Rocky movies, it's a parallel of his life. You mm -hmm. see a lot of what went on with his career, who he was as a person, mm -hmm. the ego just going absolutely berserk mm -hmm. from a guy who was just this struggling, lucky actor. And then sort of full circle again when he came around to Rocky Balboa and Creed. But right. I feel like there was a parallel between the two when you saw it play out through Rocky. Stallone famously, he'd been hanging around the, the extreme fringes of the entertainment business. Softcore porn, he did a little of that to pay the bills. I mean, yeah. listen, let he who is without sin cast the first stone, Chris. Look, let he who is about to what? I think it's a, it was either do that or sleep in a bus station. I also don't remember the first time I saw Party at Kitty and Studs. That was the name <laughs> of the movie. So I don't remember that either, but that hasn't been part of my life. Probably forever. most people have seen that because of Rocky. If you become a Rocky completist, you're going to go back to- Just curious. Like, what's this, what's what's this all about? Like? So he's not from Philadelphia, right? I think he's a born New Yorker. Or, born New York, yeah. Right? But he did spend he, some of his uh, some childhood. Time in, in he had a peripatetic childhood, as they say. Difficult parental situation, home life situation. Sure. Now, the origin story of Rocky is one of those things. It's like we could tell the legend, which is what everybody wants to hear and right. wants to believe. But the actual truth of the matter, I think, is more interesting it's kind of the same thing. It's still a Cinderella story, no matter how you decide to tell the story. But I did read a thing that said one of the public relations people at the studio realized what kind of PR gold he had in this rags to riches story and played up a lot of the elements of Stallone's own life and exaggerated some others. Specifically the idea of this battle between like, I won't sell the yes. script if you won't let me play it, which I guess I, until yesterday, really thought that that was 100% yeah. true. Or that he so, sold his dog. Oh, okay, that so that's his actual either. dog in the movie, Butkus. Yes, Butkus. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Part of the myth of the making of Rocky is he was so broke with $106 in his bank account, he had to sell his dog. I, I don't know that that's a real recipe for survival. Like, what are you going to get for a dog in 1974, 75? <laughs> and a used one at that, yeah. This principled stand, I'm not selling you the screenplay, and that, you know they exaggerate the amount of money they were going to give him. Right. $360,000 just to walk away, sell us the screenplay. No, I won't do it. It's got to be me. But the truth, Sumner, who's the PR guy, later admitted was that the studio never even met Stallone. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't matter. This reminds me of Greece. When we did Greece, we're doing a movie podcast. Chris and I watch a lot of movies. We're both people that gravitate towards movies that are good, that we like, that have dynamic acting and storytelling and directing. 
But there are certain movies where that doesn't really matter. That's not what you're here to talk about. This is one of those movies. It's just a thing. It's this character that for whatever reason in 1976 resonated beyond resonate. I mean, my God, this thing made one hundred and seventeen million dollars in 1976. That's when it cost you two bucks to go to a movie. What the fuck? Yeah, a lot of tickets, a lot of popcorn. <laughs> yeah, that's a phenomenon. That's, that's insane. Not just, yeah, that's not just it's like a, a blockbuster. That's a culture changing. So what was film. it? Why? I'll tell you a story that will sort of relate to this is that when I first met my wife, when we first started dating, the very first movie we watched together was Rocky. Was, she this, a was this a test? <laughs> that <laughs> yes, is a bold. It, it, one, yeah. 100% was. This is like, um, what's the movie, the Barry Levinson one with the kids in the high school in the 50s? And oh. Um, Diner. Diner. You know, he has a test where like if she unlocks the door for him, then yeah. she's the yep. one. This yep. was your test. This was my you test. You went right in? First date? Right in. I said, Jeez, why waste Paul. time? Wow. Well, and she goes, oh, I've never seen Rocky. I said, all right, well, I'll strike one. But let's go. <laughs> but, <laughs> the good news is I have every edition of this that oh they my never God. She was not running her own test. <laughs> now, did you take her to a screening of the movie or you watched it at home? No, was no. We, a Netflix and chill situation? No, we watched, we, at? we watched it at home. I don't want to reveal my age too much, but this was not a Netflix uh, time. <laughs> it was a VHS era. Once I Wound. And I'm looking at some of my favorite scenes and I'm kind of looking, kind of looking over to the side, gauging, seeing the interest mm-hmm. level. At the end, tears. Big tears in the eyes. Yeah. I said, all right, you know what? On to so you know, didn't pepper the screening with conversational tidbits oh, or moments or this or that. I didn't say a single word. I didn't yeah. want to taint it in any way because it was just too important to see what the result was going to be and the wow. response was going to be. Um, so <laughs> what a test! But Did think, she even know at the time what she was <laughs> auditioning for? I or mean, was, yeah, what she was getting into. Yeah. Wow. But I do think that sort of idea that um, it resonates with so many people who even people you wouldn't think might be on the surface of it into a movie like Rocky. It's not a boxing movie. It's so much more. Not even really a boxing movie when I watch it. I mean, it is, but. Compared to other boxing movies, it's really all the other stuff that I'm into and I'm invested in. Because you already know. You know from the beginning. I mean, of course, you know now. I can't remember back then if you knew then just from seeing it like, oh, the underdog's going to win. But of course, you probably do. That's the whole reason for an underdog story. But, right. But, but, that, but I mean, that's the thing. He doesn't win. He yeah. loses. Right. But the idea Spoiler that he's going to win. Spoiler for 1976. Yeah. Yeah. He wins when, by losing. When you get to the end of the movie and they're reading the decision, you're just seeing Adrian run out and you just see Adrian. You don't even care. It's still, yeah. You don't even care. It's he actually made, a little bit won. unclear even. Yeah, yeah. And I think they played with a couple versions of the ending, right? Right. And I don't know if they tried to make it unclear or whatever. Or like you said, it just sort of didn't matter. One of my most cherished possessions is an autograph Rocky poster. And the picture is Rocky Nation hand holding hands, yes. the black and white shot. It's not him in the ring. It's not him. Who it's signed it? Two of Stallone, Carl Weathers, Burt Young, and Talia Shire. Wow. Damn. Yeah, yeah. No Mickey. Some heavy hitters. I have the home security system. Is it, <laughs> is it an original poster? Uh, it looks original. Um, it, and it Damn. cost a few bucks, but it was like, uh, it's black and white. It's pretty That's kind of good. faded, but, uh, the, you know, it was that signed. That is such a great whatever. image. And w- did you read that image is not in the yeah, film? Yeah, exactly. It's from the original yeah. ending that they had filmed, which they then redid. Yeah. Where after the decision, they sort of meet and walk away hand in hand. And it's a beautiful image. Yeah. But they thought that it didn't work as well. So they refilmed it with Adrian making her way through the crowd to it. I thought also they lost that reel in a fire. I read. Oh, really? I think they all liked the shot and the ending. And the only reason they have that for the poster was because Stallone's then wife was the on-set photographer right. and had taken a few images of that setup. But then I heard that the reel was burned. I don't know if that's true or not. But that is such a great image. Yeah. And the other thing that was interesting about that scene was wherever they shot the fight. I don't know if that was in a Philly sports arena or an L.A. sports arena. They only had enough money for like 500 extras in this 20,000 seat arena. And the director is talking about what the hell are we going to do? How are we going to do this? And I think it was the cinematographer who said, why don't we shoot everything in the spotlight? So that way, everything around the spotlight is in black. And so they took Sorry. all the available 500 people when Rocky was coming out and when Apollo was coming out during the fight scenes. They put the extras around them and put a few in the tunnel and put a really bright light behind the people on the tunnel. So it sort of looked like there were more people there with shadows. And if you look at the shots, you can see it's just a spotlight tightly focused on three or four people that they had yeah, right. and then people standing behind them. But the whole rest of the arena is totally empty. That's awesome. <laughs> I like too, there's a few shots of us slapped in B-roll from like a Sinatra concert. Yeah, Some scenes yes. like 60 shots and it's uh-huh. like, yeah, they did use some. suits with like, you know, slick back hair. And I'm like, wait, where is this? They did that to from? good but, effect. Well, they sort of bury, what's the opposite of burying the lead? Uh, Leading with the lead? (laughs) (laughs) Let's say bought a billboard in Times Square. Because he says before the fight even happens, 
Uh, if I can go the distance, Absolutely. that's enough. I was, 100%. Yes. That's, that's a win. That's like, what the movie's about. It's contextualize yeah. that. And like you said, that is just the metaphor. But I mean, it's so oh. baked in there. But it is all just about this misfit who has the amazing ability to believe in himself. You had asked before of like why it resonated so much. This came out in 1976. It was nominated and won Best Picture in 1977 against Taxi Driver, All the President's Men, <laughs> yes. Network, and Bound for Glory. I have to admit, I, don't, I think. Is Bound for That's Glory a, something with a dog? Bound for Glory is the Woody Guthrie story. Well, but certainly those three, and those are uh, three oh, also very sure. important and iconic films, are all so dour and cynical and yes. terrified. And this, the optimism, the kindness, the open-heartedness of Rocky, it's a counter-programming thing that yeah. I think not only made it work, but I think that's part of why it became so iconic, because it's what people needed. We're at the end of that cynical time. You know, one other thing about that, too, you mentioned the, those movies, Network, you know, all the President's Men. I never covered the Watergate investigation. I can't live in that. <laughs> the Rocky thing, we've all had that moment, either someone we loved that we want to you know, be mm-hmm. with or some challenge that was before you thought, man, if I had one chance to yeah. make it and do whatever. And I feel like maybe that's like everyone can relate to totally. and uh, still do. So, well, yeah. and also something that I had forgotten about this movie, everybody in this movie, except for Rocky and Adrian and Gazzo, uh, sucks. Like it is. You mean as human beings? As human beings. Everybody is so mean and yelling at each other. It is just after a while so deadening. Rocky's positivity, his love of pets, the kindness that he's sort of showing to everybody. As awkward as it is, part of it is also like in relation to this world that just keeps telling you, you suck, I suck. So you got to suck just like me. Like there's this this kind of like everybody wants to drag everybody else down. And I think that becomes most particularly with Polly. That to me is a big part of it too. His ability, his and her, because like I said, it is a love story and they're both misfits to keep their integrity and what they want and their belief and trust in themselves afloat in that kind of morass. That's another struggle, like the boxing itself. Saturday Night Fever would come out a year later and had some similar things where Tony is in this group of friends where they break each other's balls constantly. Everyone around them is attacking them. And Tony, he's a more complicated character because he does wrong but means well. It's a very different movie in that respect. The other thing is if you think about the year before Rocky came out, what was the biggest box office movie of the year? It was Jaws. Mm. And Jaws was nominated for Best Picture and didn't win. I think in a way, the Rocky win is a bit of an industry acknowledgement and corrective to say popular culture movies are important. And Jaws, if you look at Jaws, Jaws is not a movie I put in the category of Greece or Rocky. Rocky is a phenomena beyond the concepts of filmmaking or acting or editing or any of those things. It just is this explosive thing. But, you know, Jaws is a master film movie and an incredibly directed piece of popular entertainment. I wonder if the Rocky win is a little bit about that. And also to what we've talked about before on the pod, which is in this era, 1975, 1976, 1977, everything did suck. We were living in a world of suck. Yeah. We had Watergate. We had the 60s. We had tumults. We had assassinations. We had all this shit. And we're in this hangover decade of the 70s, driving around in your mom's clunky Pinto. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That was my experience of it. <laughs> I don't know if your mom's had. We did have a Pinto, actually. Yeah. A white Pinto. So Which is basically like a bomb. <laughs> but yeah. do you think when the world is that shitty, for, for lack of a better word, at that yeah. point, you know, to have something that everyone can get behind. But Rocky, you can strip away all this stuff, all the cultural stuff, all of this, all the timing. At the center, it's Stallone. It's the only reason it works, really, is because of him. That willingness to put that character front and center, which is actually kind of subversively weird. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, usually if you had a movie where a guy has turtles and woos the homely pet shop girl, it's like Marty or something. Whereas this one, you have this really weird kind of combination of a tough guy who can handle himself, who is smart. He's street smart. He's socially smart and aware in every situation he's ever in. The joke is never on Rocky. If the joke is on him, he's letting it happen. He's letting it happen, which actually is a pretty interesting thing. Just reading a little bit about Stallone and some quotes from him. He knows he's got two, I guess now three pretty big franchises. He knows he can just mint money. What's the third one? I think the Expendables, Expendables Rambo and this. Oh, really? Expendables? Is that a franchise? Three or four of them? That's There's like all the old three. action guys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah, I haven't seen yeah, yeah. But that came about from yeah. either a canny or a cynical sure. move of being like, I'm Both. old, people have a nostalgia, yeah. you know, might as well bring it up. He has a lot of self-awareness, kind of like Rocky. He realizes this is the industry. Here's what I can do. Here's what I can't. Here's what I've tried to do. Here's what I kind of wish I had done. But it's kind of too late now, so I'm not going to bother regretting. He has a strong sense of self and wanting his own success. And he's kind of willing to do 
whatever sort of around it. And I think mm-hmm. Rocky is like that too. Well, let's come back to this character being this mix of this guy who in the opening scenes beating Spider Rico to death in this club yeah. fight. And then he goes home to feed his domestic turtles as he <laughs> likes to call them and his goldfish. Hey, your old man did pretty good tonight. Why weren't you there, huh? You should have seen me. You guys hungry? No? Here you go. Here you go. You want to see your friend Moby Dick, huh? Hey, you doing, Moby Dick? You miss me today or what? Huh? Huh? Yeah, you go say hi. You know, if you guys could sing or dance, I wouldn't be doing this, you know. Stallone even says, Rocky's who also I wish I could be. That's the very right. best of a person. I've obviously never been, you know, as good as that mm-hmm. who has. But to have that mix of a character of a guy who's so violent, so tough, but also so genuine and warm. Like you said, I don't think I've ever seen a more self-aware character. When Gazzo tells him, uh, I heard you going out on a date with that pet shop. Girl. Yeah. And the driver goes, hey, Rock, I hear she's retarded. You yes. know? And Rocky goes, oh, no, no, no. She's just shy. Yep. Like, he's not even offended by this. Yeah. He's yeah. almost like, no, no, no. I, I get how you might come to that conclusion. Yep. But just rolls with it or whatever until he feels like he's finally been pushed too far by that guy. Right. But otherwise, yep. he's very aware of his lot in life. That's yet another endearing thing. Another endearing, character, and, but you know? also heartbreaking. When he gets offered the fight with Apollo Creed oh, and his yeah. first impulse is to say no. 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 Yeah. yeah, exactly. Which like, is amazing. Here, here's the thing you've always wanted yeah. Yeah. and money to boot. And you don't even have to wait. He's like, yeah, no. no. He knows who he is. Absolutely. Tell me, Rocky, you got any representation? You have a manager? Uh, no, just me. Oh. Rocky, I've got a proposition I'd like to make to you. Uh, a, a sparring? Beg your pardon? Well, I just said I know you're looking for sparring partners, and I just want to say I'm very available, you know? I'm sure you are. Absolutely. Uh, sparring with the champ would be an honor, and you know what, Mr. Jerkins? What? I wouldn't take no cheap shots either. I'd really be a good sparring partner, you know? You don't understand me, Rocky. My proposition's this. Would you be interested in fighting Apollo Creed for the World Heavyweight Championship? No. Listen, Rocky. Apollo's seen you fight. He likes you. He wants to fight you. Well, it's just that you see, uh... I fight in clubs, you know, and I'm really a ham and egg. This guy, he's the best, and uh, it wouldn't be such a good fight. But th- thank you very much, you know, I appreciate it. All that. But the downside of it is if that keeps you from trying or taking an opportunity, that's sad and yes. heartbreaking. And of course, that there is a turn. I was doing a show with somebody once, and she was talking about getting offered a role. She's like, ah, I don't know. I don't, th- I don't think I'm right for this mm-hmm. part. And I was like, who cares? Like, if the director, if they think you're right for it, give it a shot. Don't let other right. people's opinion in the past or that kind of fear stop you from taking the shot. Potentially looking ridiculous, which if Rocky and Adrian are courting the entire time, like you said, there's a self-awareness. It's not like he doesn't care if he looks ridiculous, but he's like, I'm willing to risk it for something greater. I love in the press conference scene where he's playing his part, but the only time he comes alive is when he is talking to Adrian through the TV. Tell me, how do you feel about your challenger? How do I feel about it? Yeah. What do you mean? Come here, Rock. It's my main man. Rocky, ain't you Italian? Yeah, I'm Italian. That's... Well, now, what does that mean? That means if he can't fight... I bet he can cook. (laughs) (laughs) Do me a favor. As long as you punch out. Well, Rocky, how do you expect to fight Apollo Creed? Uh, Oh, geez, you know, Creed's the best. Uh, I guess I'll have to do the best I can. Uh, Tell me, Rocky, just between us, where did you get the name Italian Stallion? Oh, uh, I invented that uh, about eight years ago when I was eating dinner. Rocky, now your payday will be $150,000. Any comment? Uh, you no. you got no comment, Rocky, right? No. No comment. No. Right. Thank you, Rocky, oh, very wait, much. Wait, I just want to say hi to my girlfriend, okay? Uh, yeah. Yo, Adrian, it's me, Rocky. Look at this. <laughs> you believe all this? Look at the microphone. Rocky didn't. <laughs> Thank you, Rocky. Well, you Rocky. push him, man. Thank you, Thank you, Rocky. Well, well no matter he's making you out a fool and break his loose. He's taking cheap shots. Don't bother me, none. Even with all that, his one thought is, if I could just yep. say hi to Adrian, you know, yeah, like, yeah. which is just, you know, again, that that love story. With I think you're right. It is a love story, first and foremost. The only time he does sort of acknowledge that he doesn't like the look is when he goes out and he says to Adrian, Hey, you know, I said that stuff on TV didn't bother me, none. Yeah. 
did. He does feel he is aware. That's pretty heartbreaking. He was never meant to be put in that kind of a spotlight. They kind of make him look ridiculous and he's aware of it. He doesn't buy into the bullshit. I think Stallone at that point already knew. And yes, it's a game to be played and to be won. And he did play it and win it. But Rocky's free of all that shit. He doesn't buy into that part of it. Well, it even says that. He says when Paulie says they're Rocky, I don't understand. What do you see in my sister? And Rocky goes, I don't know. We fill gaps. She's got yeah, gaps. Yeah, that's I got a great gaps, scene. You know? That acknowledgement that, yeah, I know who I am and I know who she yeah. is. Well, this, you know, is, great. this might be a good time to bring in the, the ice skating just scene. Just queuing it up for you right now. You can see I ain't too graceful, you know what I mean? I don't move well. But I'll tell you, I can really swat, you know what I mean? I can really hit hard. But I'm a southpaw and nobody wants to fight no southpaw, you know what I mean? Huh? You know how I got started in fighting? Huh? No. Am I talking too loud? Three no. minutes! Okay. My father, he's uh, my old man. He was never too smart. He says to me, you weren't born much of a brain, you know, so uh, you better start using your body, right? So I've become a fighter. Oh. You know what I mean? <laughs> why, you, why are you left? My mother, she said the opposite thing. What'd she say? What'd she say the opposite? She said you weren't born much of a body, so you better develop your brain. Did she say that? You! Hi! The great George Mamoli at the end. Yeah. From Phantom our of Phantom of Paradise. Paradise episode. But what yeah, great speaking scene. of uh, the gaps, they both had this advice denigrating one part of them. This is a, what's the word when you don't have something and it's a virtue? When you, you know what I mean? A particular, it's like, oh, they, the fact that you don't have it is a good thing? No, you think, well, originally in the screenplay, it was supposed to be like a fully crowded skating session and they were going to be amidst all the extras and all yeah, that, yeah. but they didn't have the money. Yeah. Like a happy accident. Because they didn't have the money, they ended up doing it this way. And then when they got there, it turned out Stallone couldn't skate. <laughs> so that's why she's on skates and he's on his shoes, but it actually works really well oh, because I read beautiful. somebody said like they end up holding each other up. Isn't that great too though? Like even just like any kind of art, it could be music, it could be anything where you hear of these like masterpieces and you look and you go, oh, something happened in the studio. And like, there's no way that could have been as charming if there was a full crowd there, nope. if he's on yeah. skates. And, and I just love him just talking, talking, talking. And he has like this breakthrough at the end. That's, What'd she say? What did you, what did your mom yeah, say? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know, he's like, all right, you know, made it. Yeah. And, uh, Talia Shire. Amazing. Perfect. The first scene, Gloria, the, uh, the pet shop owner, Adrian is trying to do her job and kind of keep it together. And everything is so loud, including Rocky. You can see why he scares her off a little bit. <laughs> well, even that too, when Gloria yells at her, yeah. it's like you see Rocky trying to, you know, make, you know, trying to talk to her, trying yeah. to get somewhere. And then Gloria's like, did you go down there and clean the cages out or whatever? And yeah. you see her look at Rocky, she's kind of embarrassed, you know? Yeah. And it's like, it's so like, I don't know, she, she doesn't want to look like that in front of Rocky. But that's the foundation of Rocky to me, is those two and the goodness represented in his interest in her. It feels equal to me, like you're saying. She's got gaps. I got gaps. Our gaps fit. They have each other. It's amazing that they found each other and that they were able to like break that wall to kind of like actually get together. But yeah, you don't feel like he's saving her. You don't feel like, you know, she's certainly supportive of him and believes in him. And yeah, I don't feel like she's some sort of damsel that he's saving at all. And Polly, besides being a, a friggin' jerk. How awesome is Burt Young? Amazing. Right. <laughs> but when they come over for Thanksgiving oh. for the first oh, uh, Thanksgiving oh. thing, when he's yelling at her like, Hey, I want you out of here systematically. I'm sick of seeing you hanging around like a freaking spider. Go out and live. Enjoy life. Boy, I can't go. Don't get wise with me now, huh? I'm tired of you being a loser. Don't call me that, Polly. Go, go Polly. I can't go, Polly. I won't go. Why? Polly, it's Thanksgiving. I got a turkey in the oven. Oh, a turkey in the oven. You want the bird? Go in the alley and eat the bird. Oh, boy. I want you out of here. Get out of the house. Go out and enjoy your freaking life. I guess it's a nice inspirational message, but the way he's delivering it, yelling at her through the door, having no, just I'll stay in the kitchen. The Thanks. Out. That's um, why we all watch football on Thanksgiving. We don't want to be subjected to that. And it's also went from one of the saddest Thanksgivings ever to like, <laughs> <laughs> when he throws that bird in the alley, my God. And like Rocky says, he goes, to you, it's Thanksgiving. To me, it's just Thursday. Just Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. And it's such a great, <laughs> says a lot about Rocky. You talked about how much he's talking during their date. And even though he has pictures of his parents, like he's very alone. And I think that's part of the reason why he does talk so much and is reaching out because he has no family, no connection, no. You're neglecting the warm love, trust, and support of two turtles. Uh, he's got Cuff and Link. 
honestly, I don't find them that supportive. Well, and I guess if this Rocky is, is clearly devoted to them. Sure, he's devoted to them, but what is he getting back from them? He Hoffman still has them. Stallone still has the same two turtles. They're still alive. Turtles live forever. I know. So yeah, you could go to Sly's house. He has the turtles. Well, look, it's so he's still got a dysfunctional 40 years of love back from these turtles. Well, <laughs> I mean, he's fed them for 40 years. Moths and crickets or whatever they right. What is it? The moths make yeah, cough. Too many moths. Yeah, the moths make them cough. More moths Are the moths supposed to be in the turtle food? If we have any turtle experts listening. <laughs> I'm turtle expert. That loneliness and just that everyone's shitting on him. He's at Nikki's and he loses his locker. He's on. He's bagged and put on Skid Row. Gazzo gives him a hard time because he doesn't break the guy's thumbs. The driver's giving him a hard time. Uh, Adrian's giving st- like it's just all. Oh. And when you see that shitty apartment and even uh, when she comes back, it's great. like and the picture of him as a little kid too is also the thing. Like, yep. hey, he did. He he came from somewhere. Great production design in the yeah. the set because all the interior stuff I believe are all sets in L.A. and then they famously shot. Just a few days running and gunning in Philadelphia, no permits, very small crew. You can even see in the famous montage in that scene where he's running down the outdoor market and somebody tosses Rocky an orange or something. (laughs) That just happened. You can see if you watch the scene, people are looking at it the way they look at like, oh, there's a car driving down the market with a guy jogging behind it and a movie camera. Who the fuck? And then nobody knows who Sylvester Stallone is at the time. There are also a lot of the great things about the screenplay are also things like that that were either improvised or happy accidents. Specifically, the shorts thing. Oh, yeah. The the poster has the the wrong wrong one. Color scheme. And that was something that actually happened. You know, good for Sylvester Stallone. Like, take that detail and make it fly. And it it becomes part of the way the system is not looking out for him. I also feel like it's that it's a moment of a, a flip of the switch where he goes, wait a minute, I'm just getting caught up in this train Everyone's behind me. Everyone's excited. Holy shit. I can't win this. This is yeah. a joke that I'm even here. And that's when he goes home and has the conversation with Adrian, which totally. is, yeah. to me, just like, oh, I can Which is big, right, partially that. because of the promoter, exactly. like his reaction. Yeah. 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 I love the promoters wearing like calfskin gloves. He's like, <laughs> the promoter's out of like a 1920s, <laughs> yeah. you know, boxing Damon Runyon story. Along the same lines was uh, his monologue to Mickey. Apparently oh, yeah. it was completely improvised. You mean when Mickey shows back up to try and when manage Mickey him? When Mickey leaves and he's like. 10 years to come to my house. Oh, what's the matter? You don't like my house? My house stink? That's right, it stinks! I never no better from you! Don't fall around me! Talk about your prime. What about my prime, Mick? At least you had a prime! I ain't had no prime, I ain't had a nut! Legs are going, everything is going, no one's getting no nut! Guy comes up, offers me a fight. Big deal, want to fight the fight. Yeah, I'll fight the big fight. I wouldn't want to fight that big fight. It was going to happen to me. I'm going to get that. I'm going to get that. And you want to be ringside and see it? Do you? You want to help me out? Help me out. I see me get my face kicked in. Legs ain't working. Nothing's working. They go, go on, fight the champ. Yeah, I'll fight him. My face kicked in. You know, as open hearted and great and kind as Rocky is, he is not just an angel with mm-hmm. no other side. It's a choice that he is making to push them to the side. The same thing as he as he does with the press conference. I have to keep my resentment down. And then, of course, after venting, he takes Mickey up on his offer. That's like the impressively deep stuff about the story in the screenplay is yeah. like, it's all true. Mickey did discount him and Rocky needs Mickey. So they have that whole great scene yeah. where like they have it out. Of course, you have Burgess Meredith. So, I mean, my God, he just is imbued with the pain and the his own wasted talent and the the hope to make it right. And it's actually, that's an amazing scene. Yeah. And then what's so brilliant is the reproachment part takes place and you never hear it because it's just shot down the street. You can see them physically having a conversation in which they shake hands. And of course, brilliantly, the train passes right by. Yeah. They don't play that part for us. That's between them. Absolutely, but you do, you do get both of those things. Yeah, but yeah, you finally show up, and he gives him the hard time the whole time. Yeah. He gives him the cold shoulder. Yeah, I got heart like Rocky Marciano, but I ain't got no locker, right, Mick? Like, I'm going to let yeah. you know yeah. Yeah. you bailed on me. And then, like you said, ultimately, though, yeah. he needs him. Rocky died. He needed him for 10 years, you yeah. know, and then he, yeah. and he finally gets him. And just a side note, too, about uh, when Burgess Meredith walks in, that one of my favorite lines, he walks in and he goes, uh, <laughs> he opens the door, and Rocky opens the door, sees Mickey there, and Mickey goes, Hey, it's a nice place here. All right, anyway. <laughs> and he immediately goes that like the small, his inability for small talk is just incredible. Yeah, just right to the chase. So transparent. It's so fucking anyway. funny. <laughs> we now have a toll-free telephone number. That's and right. We would like listeners to call us. Let me log in so I can figure out what our number is because I purposely chose a good one. And what we want you to do is something like call us and 
leave us a message. Do I need to be That's more specific it. than that, Chris? Yeah. You could say anything you want. You anyway. can have suggestions of what we should do, shouldn't do. You Tell know. us a movie that you've got to watch all the way through whenever it's on. Things that you hate in movies. I would think that something we would have fun with is if people said, I want you guys to address this trope and let, let us find some examples to say, we got this great voicemail from a listener and they mentioned this filmic trope. Call us toll free 855-755-5322. That's 855-755-5322. Two, two. That is very memorable. Yeah. 855-755-5322. Yeah. Um, now, Chris is going to record a clever voicemail thing so that when you call, you're going to hear him and he's going to figure out how to do it. Yeah, there's that. value added. Let's play a little uh, Mick. I got all this knowledge. I got it up here and I, I want to give it to you. I want to give you this knowledge. I want to take care of you. I want to make sure that all this shit that happened to me doesn't happen to you. You know what I mean? The fight said. Listen to me. I want to be your manager. You follow that, do you? Fight said I don't need no manager. But you can't buy what I'm going to give you. I mean, I've got pain and I've got experience. Well, I got pain I've got experience, too. Now, listen, kid. Hey, look, hey, Mick. What? Look, I need your help about 10 years ago, right? 10 years ago? Right. You never helped me, no. You didn't care. Well, if you wanted help. I say, if you wanted help, why didn't you ask? Why didn't you just ask me, kid? Look, I asked, but you never heard nothing. Well, I, I, uh, I know I, I'm 76 years old. And, uh, uh, fucking scene you should have just asked i yeah. did ask you didn't hear yeah. we the viewer will never know yeah but they both are feeling it burgess meredith man talk about a pro in that one little clip it's like a master class in acting all his little physical movements how he forgets his hat at the end there's a feature on the rocky dvd i think it's carl weathers who's like that's his favorite scene in the whole movie because he's watching burgess meredith get ready to leave rocky's apartment and he touches his head he realizes he forgot his hat and he finds the hat he puts the hat on and then he does this little head cock of resigned acknowledgement that it's not going to work out yeah. and then he exits all that stuff is non-verbal but the lines that he delivers so imbued with that sadness and sense of failure yeah no there's not just a shot for rocky yeah it's a shot for him this is the one yeah. he never got it's an incredible scene as a kid, I only knew him as the Penguin. So I was going to say, you know, it's great. That I've already got this voice kind of worked out. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember him too from the Twilight Zone, where he's the yeah. la the guy who just wants to read yes, books. Yes, yes. And, and gets his, his glasses. His glasses. <laughs> Spoiler for <laughs> great. Nineteen fifty-eight's The Twilight Zone. Yeah, to go back to Stallone, I like this story, even if this is a myth. Famously, Mike Medavoy was the head of United Artists and loved the concept of this project, but he needed to convince a guy named Arthur Krim, who is the CEO of United Artists. And Arthur Krim said he would consider it, but he wanted to know more about who this Sylvester Stallone <laughs> character is. And Stallone had recently appeared in The Lords of Flatbush. So Metavoy thought Stallone was excellent, and he sent a copy of the movie to New York and told him to watch it. And the story is Arthur Krim watched, asked someone sitting near him, which one's Stallone? And somebody told him it was Perry King, who's this yeah. total blonde, blue-eyed, <laughs> handsome kid. And Krim was like, oh. And he said, he doesn't look very Italian. And apparently the executive said, oh, no, he must be from northern Italy, <laughs> where there's a lot of blue-eyed, blonde-haired Italians. Krim thought about it and said, I like Stallone. And he greenlit the movie. That's one slightly less apocryphal version of what actually happened. Right. Which is sort of you squeak through. And you know, to get anything greenlit, you have to require so many people who don't know anything about what the hell you're doing to say yes. Yeah. And yeah. This, this has the ring of truth to me. Yeah. The little mistake, like once the guy realized like, oh, Sylvester Stone's not the guy. Like, oh, well. I mean, I already greenlit it. Yeah. Might as well keep, <laughs> might as well keep it. The great Joe Spinell. Oh, it's the Joe Spinell. Joe Spinell famously Godfather 1 and 2. 
Willie Chichi. He's the guy testifying in the great scene in front of the congressional hearing. That's right, Senator. We got a lot of buffers. <laughs> it's funny. I haven't seen this movie in long enough. I kept waiting for him to put the hooks into Rocky because right, right. I'm so educated to that by subsequent movies. But no, he doesn't. Which is such like a nice surprise. It makes it just feel very human, as does the detail of him having the inhaler. asthma inhaler, yeah, which... Yeah. I guess was another happy accident yes. that he actually was having an asthma attack while they were filming. And but I always get that with yeah. Gazzo too. I always get the Gazzo thing being like the same guy, He's like an outsider, a guy from yeah. the streets, and he takes a cigarette out too. I love that. Come well, on, come on, you're in training. training. <laughs> if you're a Philadelphia mobster, you feel the same way. The real mob is in New York. That's right, right, right. Okay, like you're a Philadelphia mobster. Yeah, it's local like, boy you got a little. Yeah, yeah. You're always a little bit of an underdog as well. A couple interesting side notes. Commander Worf is in Rocky. Michael Dorn's first film role. As Apollo Creed's bodyguard. bodyguard. Are you a Star Trek nerd? <laughs> no, not Come like on. I'm a He's a Rocky fan. Rocky, fan. <laughs> Rocky fans are not Star Trek nerds. There's an overlap, <laughs> obviously. Come on. You know who Worf is? Apollo's bodyguard is. So. Yeah, so I know that's that Worf. Yeah, yeah. That's Michael yep. Dorn. That's great. The founder of Trauma Films. Yeah, Lloyd, Lloyd Kaufman. Kaufman. That's crazy. Now, which was he? Was he the guy? He was the that, drunk outside the bar. We carried in. Oh, that, okay. Yeah. Because I was also trying to figure out whose thumbs was he supposed to break? Because that's that's a great little performance. The Doc. That's the Doc, yeah. yeah. Oh, the yeah, Doc's yeah, guy. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't I, don't know who I couldn't figure out which character was. Bob in the movie. That's another, like, Rocky philosophy thing. You want to dance, you got to pay the man. You want to dance. You want to ball, you got to pay the man. He tries to reason with Gazzo, like, <laughs> you break his thumbs, you guy can't work, you can't pay you back. So let me do the reasoning. Let me do the reasoning. Let me do the reasoning. God is so tight with, with his choice of person. Let me do the reasoning. The guy's got a real sense of humor. Who's How do you Tom? spell Tony Del Rio? Oh, yeah. Oh, putting on his glasses totally. to like write yeah. down whose legs he's so got. It's a break. yard from Cabola <laughs> and 300. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, Stallone is similar to Dolly Parton. They're gonna both make the joke about themselves that you're thinking before you can make it. And I think this movie to start him off was perfect for that. He's focused on what's really important. He's not focused on the bullshit. Yeah. And then years later, he'd get to that. <laughs> of course he got to that because, yeah. yeah, I mean, how could you not? I mean, yeah. you make a movie for a million dollars that makes $117 million. Yeah. But then he came back out the other end, like, towards the end. Oh, well, of course. A whole different film, artist, yeah, yeah. yeah. artistic job, integrity but. can be tiring. Like, you can take a couple <laughs> years off. <laughs> well, do, uh, you, know, you mean the quest Rumble for shoot. it? Because... Yeah, that, he uh, was that searching too. for it. But once, once he but got really, a little bit of he money, he channeled that like, into his painting. His collection of Persian knives. But you, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. I want to go into the Stallone collection of clothing, knives, home furnishings. Is, is that stuff that he's selling? Yes. No, this is like his official merchandise. Intricately inlaid. If you're looking for a fourth. Pocket knives and stuff. Yeah. Christmas yeah. is yeah. coming. Uh, of course, I remember, <laughs> I remember you were mentioning it. You've been looking for a $4,000 pen. So if you're yeah. looking at that stuff. Oh, yeah, that's right. The pens, yeah. the ornate pens. This yeah. Is the, this is the Da Vinci model. Oh, another thing you mentioned, you guys were talking about turning something into a virtue, which is still, there's still a phrase that I'm searching for that yeah. I can't, that you're letting me down by not remembering. It's not a bug, uh, it's a feature. Misfortune into a virtue or? Uh, virtue itself turns vice being misapplied and vice sometimes by action dignified. That can't Paul. be what you were looking for. <laughs> another one is, in addition to the trunks, the robe. The reason yeah. he yes, says yes. to Adrian, Hey, is this robe too bulky, too big? Because they got the wrong size robe. Yep. Yeah. I was bummed that they didn't do a robe. Like, I wanted Adrian to have made the robe for Rocky, a la Ed Harris's wife in Apollo 13. Every flight, the box comes, and his wife made him a vest with the mission patch on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I yep. wanted that. I wanted Adrian yeah. to, like, Rock, I made you this. And had, like, some clumsy hand lettering on the back. And I like that Gazzo's there, too, when he walks by. And Gazzo says, hey, check out, like, I'm here. Like, like Gazzo's there. And yeah, he's yeah. like, hey, thanks for coming. Like, he's about to go fight yeah. Apollo. <laughs> and he's like, is this great guy? Everyone so nice showed guy. up. He's such, yeah. He insane. just wants people. Speaking of Joe Spinell as Gazzo, he was in Godfather, Godfather 2, and Rocky. So those all one best picture. Talia Shire is also in all three of those. Going along with that line of being uh, in three movies with the best picture, you know the John Casale who played Fredo? Yes. Was in five movies. All nominated. That's yeah. Picture, which is like two uh, Godfathers. Deer Hunter. Deer Hunter. Two Godfathers, Deer Hunter. Dog Day Afternoon. Afternoon. Dog Day Afternoon. And The Conversation. Fuck. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. His only five movies. He I think maybe so. yeah. Yeah. Well, they were the only ones. That's kind of like um, our episode last week was High Noon and Grace Kelly had an acting career. It was only five years. Yeah. And in that five years, she made High Noon. 
all those great Hitchcock movies. And then it's like, okay, I'm done. I retired. Yeah. I was listening to that episode. And when you guys mentioned that thing about the five years, I couldn't believe that that was the case. Because yeah. even the way the, the movies look from high noon to, uh, so to Catch a Thief or something, yeah, they seem yeah. like they're decades, of, you know, a decade apart, but yeah. they're not. So John Avildsen, the director here, I ended up seeing a documentary about him on a plane. Okay. Because I was like exhausted from entertainment options. And I was like, all right, I'll watch this two hour documentary about John Avildsen. He's made some good movies, but he's really more known for like the populist films that he's made, like Karate Karate Kid, Karate Kid 2, Rocky, although I guess he famously didn't direct Rocky 2. Stallone directed it. Yeah. Oh, Stallone did Rocky 2. Okay. He came back for five. Only he didn't come back until five? Yep, because Stallone directed the rest of them. Oh, he did. He came back, which was a trap. You know, that movie. And I think that's considered the worst. Okay, so what's the hierarchy? Is this the best Rocky film? Yeah, definitely. I think without it, the rest of it doesn't matter. Two is really interesting. It's a little bit more of a slow burn. It's more of his domesticity and this grappling with can I fight anymore? Can I not? Also, the first 30 minutes, that movie are hilarious. Like, there's a lot of really funny Stallone moments where he applies for a job at a bank, which is really great. Then, this is going to sound really crazy, but I'll throw Rocky Balboa third. That's the more recent one. Yeah, that was the sixth one. He came back full circle. He became Rocky again. Nice closure. It felt like a nice makeup for five. I don't love seeing him in the ring again, but it's okay, and it feels as realistic as a Rocky Mm -hmm. fight can be. Um, You don't like seeing him in the ring because... Like he's By old, that point, feel, okay. he's so old, it's so insane that he would get back in the ring, he would die. But it's got one of the best speeches ever in a Rocky film is in Rocky Balboa. Uh-huh. The one that he gives to his son in front of the restaurant. I've shown that to people uh, who aren't even Rocky fans, and they were like ready to go out and just like take on the world. The fact that he wrote that this far into his career mm-hmm. and down the line with Rocky to me was like, oh, perfect. One last great moment with him. Then I go three just because three was the one I really, really grew up with. Uh, four is a music video reflection of the MTV 1985 mm. peak. There's two training sequences because yeah, it's a music video. Well, why not? Is that yeah. Dolph Lundgren one? Yeah, that's yeah. Dolph. Now, I know a lot of people love that one. Uh, it just doesn't ring true to me. And then Rocky five is the worst. That's the one Avilton came back yes. for. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Coming back for that. Yeah. And Avilton said Stallone was so checked out. Have you seen Creed, the two Creed course, movies? Yeah, totally. Do first, you put them Creed, in there? Well, if I had to slot them in there, then I'll slot Creed, uh, maybe even just a little ahead of Rocky Four. I really liked it. Yeah. Um, Creed Two. I mean, I, do you I, consider I, them part of the Rocky canon? I consider the first Creed part of it still because that was like, seemed like a natural place for Rocky sure. to go. Sure, why not? A second one with that felt like, okay, now I'm in sequel yeah. territory again. Chris, like, you're a fan of both. You I, like both, I right? am a fan of both. Yeah. Actually, I was surprised by how Good much movie. I liked it. I just don't feel like it I got so it into Rocky. toxic masculinity. And actually, the stuff with Drago and his son was just. Yeah. heartbreaking <laughs> yeah yeah like the father's son stuff in that there were so many yeah. layers to that but uh i was surprised at how much new stuff they found in creed 2 though like you said by now it's like sorry rocky what are you doing here? <laughs> I, I, I will say this too <laughs> when i saw creed in the theaters i remember going to see him with a friend uh who is as big a rocky fan as i am we went first day it came out and you see the, the pamphlet that he's got cancer. He's like, the yeah. literature about the cancer. I leaned over to him. That's the only time we spoke to him. I said, if Rocky dies, we're going to have a big <laughs> problem on our hands. Okay, we got to talk about the probably the most famous montage in American cinema history. Is that fair to say? I think so. I mean, I can't name another montage as famous as the Rocky training montage. Uh, I guess the Rocky IV training <laughs> montage <laughs> Which might one? be. First one or the second one? When that scene starts and that music kicks in, Bill Conti's amazing score. I mean, I forgot about the first time Rocky tries to run up the steps and can't do it. We're running and gunning on the streets of Philadelphia. This is not a big permitted union movie. They're just grabbing this shit where they can. Those were both shot on the same day. One in the morning, one in the afternoon, early evening. The victorious one is actually the golden hour, early evening part. I have yeah. run up those stairs, just so you know. I was going to yeah, ask you. Yeah, yeah, I did. I was like, are you that Rocky yeah, guy? Yeah, Do you I have am, a photo? I am. Did your wife frame that for you as a gift? And uh, it, she's uh, like, oh my God. Yeah, it was a visit to Philly. I said, okay, so where are the stairs? I don't care about the museums. I don't care about this. I don't care about <laughs> well, there's Philly a statue there steaks, now, whatever. There? It's been moved a couple of times, but at the time it was right near there. So Bill Conti, who I think did a great job on the score, obviously. Six trumpets. It requires six trumpets to give you that brass, not two, not three, not huh. four. So he has this whole interview thing where he's like, it's six. That's why you freak out. The layered brass gives it that push into your bloodstream. And he says, everything else in a movie is an intellectual exercise, but the music is really the only part of the movie that is not intellectualized. He's like, I think about it a lot. I'm intellectualizing as I'm trying to figure out what to do. But for you, the viewer. But it's appealing on an emotional. It's an emotional thing only. He says for him, the greatest compliment is when someone says, I didn't really notice the score. He's like, 
I know I did my job really well oh, because yeah. that means they're invested in the scene. And then he famously said that one of the producers said, could it have some words? And so he kept the word super elemental, like getting stronger. Yeah. And it was, I think he says it's his wife and some of her coworkers that he brought well, into his studio. He's like, do you have any coworkers <laughs> that can sing? And she was like, yeah, there's people that can sing. One of the things that I really liked about the beginning was that there was no music for the mm-hmm. first bunch of minutes, especially because it is so inspirational. You kind of hear it even before it happens. But then just watching it and you have this this dirty, mm-hmm. uh, <sighs> shitty fight yep. that starts it off. And like, I don't even know where the score does first come in because it for such a not subtle score, he does build until, you know, you get to that montage and it's uh, undeniable. Sort of too thinking about that, the, you know, the iconic "Gonna Fly Now" the trumpet uh, yeah. version of the song. But you think about the softer part of the song, yeah. the the more yeah. downtrodden stuff's going on. The first time he's training, when he gets up in the morning and he does mm-hmm. the run up the stairs and he's, yeah. and he's in pain, yeah. that music is super emotional as well. Right, it's yeah. not yeah. just the yeah. triumph; yeah. it's that it's part of it that gives it the struggle. The you know, yeah. and uh, his well, theme so. for Adrian is beautiful. Oh. Like every time she's on camera, you have to feel this fragility, this shyness. I think but, Rocky does whistle the theme coming into the pet shop the first time. That may be the first time I you noticed, hear yeah. the musical cue of what's going to be the theme. I wonder if that was deliberate or if he was just like, it's so catchy. I forgot that it was I just everybody be, uh, couldn't get it out of their heads, probably. In Rocky Three, when they dedicate the statue to Rocky, uh-huh. when they give him the statue, the high school band is playing Gonna Fly Now. I'm like, wait a minute, what's, <laughs> what's happening? It's getting better. Yeah, no, yeah, it's getting better. By the way, Carl Weathers, I thought, did a really interesting job And I was surprised anew at the less caricatured version of the black athlete. He's in charge of his own business. Now, of course, at the end, he sort of doesn't take Rocky seriously enough, but someone in his entourage does. Right. It's not the white promoter who's all knowing and pulling the strings. Carl Weathers is his own hype man and he's handling the press and he's doing all these things that he's doing in addition to being the fighter. Send the mayor's wife 200 roses from me and make sure we get a picture of it for all the newspapers. Do you want to run the 15 radio spots in the Midwest? I think you could spend your money better in Canadian publicity. By the way, Apollo, I've got a couple of friends up in Toronto who'd probably be able to get you a pretty good tax break. <laughs> George, I like your friends. Hey, champ. You ought to come look at this boy you're going to fight on TV. Looks like he means business. Yeah, yeah, I mean business too. Hey, Shirley, we got any more coffee out there? Okay, so it's also about the class system, how the establishment wants to keep the little guy down. But then in the movie, you also have in the Gazo and the thing you have, if the establishment's keeping the Philly underclass down, the Philly underclass is going to get their own version of a class that will then oppress everyone else. But it's interesting that you talk about the race stuff because of when they were filming this, Philly was is very famous mm-hmm. for that time, having had a particularly bad racial situation mm-hmm. with Frank Rizzo, a sort of crypto fascist police commissioner who firebombed uh, yeah, the move black. bombing. I don't know what to make of it, but I'm, I'm very conscious of that when watching this, especially because this takes place in 76 or 75. Yeah. They're talking about leading up to the bicentennial and there's so much of both the hype and the reasons why people do things that they say has to do with this idea of the American dream. But in the same way that there's a sort of black market underclass Mm -hmm. that they create, the banks won't do it. You got to have somebody like Gazzo. So too, there's this version of the American dream when you got to hustle and do what you can. It becomes just a real commentary on the limits of the American dream and Mm -hmm. how it has to be adapted going into the bicentennial. At the time, everyone's thinking about America, what it is and what it isn't. Rocky comes out exactly at that time to embody what we can be, but also pretty grittily show what we are. I mean, yeah. it's such a very, it's a very dirty movie. The streets are dirty. The, you know, it's, yeah, it, it is, is, it's like a hellscape. 
in that. It, I don't know. It's a hellscape, but it's, I mean, it's pre- like it's pretty friggin' bad. Like again, when I think he Philly sees is a hellscape. As the, a Patriots fan, it's a hellscape. These people eat dog. The poop. These people eat horse poop. Chris, a Philadelphia Eagles fan, famously ate horse poop on the streets. That's Why? The, for to, to show celebrate. dedication, <laughs> celebration, Chris. <laughs> I don't want to get on a tangent. Now, speaking of tangents, though, do you know that Stallone famously doesn't own Rocky? For all the power and the leverage, you would think at any one moment he might have been able to sort of insert that. But he made certainly a lot of money and still makes a lot of money. Ownership is a different thing. And that's sort of a legacy totally. thing that could mean something. But at the time, that was the way business was done. And you just didn't kind of get those things. It sounds like he acknowledges a little bit. He didn't he didn't push for it. He didn't draw a line in the sand. Come Rocky too. Yeah, you would have think yeah. you would have the you kind of be like, point. well, you can't do this without me. Right. So let's work something yeah. out here. Yeah. Yeah. He like, says, uh, here's his quote. Quote, I have zero ownership of Rocky. Every word, every syllable, every grammatical error was all my fault. It was shocking that it never came to be, but I was told, hey, you got paid. So what are you complaining about? I was furious. That said, he blames his own naivete and lack of business savvy at the time for not pushing the issue hard enough. Yeah. He said, quote, you don't want to ruffle the feathers of the golden goose. Speaking of the upper class keeping people down, like that's definitely the kind of thing that, yeah. you know, yeah. when you're the money man, it's like, listen, don't push too hard. Right, right. You got it. Yeah, you're in the movie. Be yeah, thankful. we're also yeah, sort of like, made. you know, 1976, you're still just turning a corner from like a studio system oh, yeah. to different types of movies. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No actor had cachet to dictate those terms. I'm not sure. Was there a franchise before Rocky? I mean, like, other than like, Bond. you know. Bond. Yeah, Bond. Yeah. Nice. yeah, the other ones were just Is there anything you know, else a couple of sequels, but nothing like to the extent that they did more than two. You know, and then in the 80s, then he's going to get into this whole thing with Schwarzenegger where it's like yeah. dueling yeah. action franchises. It's weird too, because like at 75, you had Jaws, which would go on to be a franchise, even though the first one was yeah. vastly better than the rest. But, you know, they made a lot of them. I mean, at least four. Hey, don't slag off Jaws 3D. <laughs> and then like <laughs> 76, you get Rocky and they make a bunch of those. And then 77, you get Star Wars. And then, you know, so it seems like that was sort of the launching pad for a lot of yeah. those. But yeah. that's why even with the ownership thing, you think about the merchandising, say, of a Star Wars, something yeah. like that was still a year away, you know, from yeah, people really true. knowing even about that. So Yeah, conversely, like, I think though. George Lucas was like, I'll give you X, Y, and Z. Just give me some I'll take small the percentage the of the tour. Whatever. The tour exactly. Toys, yeah. The opposite of the naivete. He knew that that's... The when I buy my four huge. iterations of Baby Yoda for Christmas this year, George is still going to get <laughs> exactly. a percentage. Still mind. getting his taste there. Put that one back. All right, Chris, do you want to do any alternative casting? Speaking of casting, I would not change a single pick. Go ahead. Give me some. Oh, no, this oh, is more like options. what they were considered. Oh, the okay. options were considered God. before. Don't worry. So they, no, it's not like Rocky's <laughs> not going to die in this conversation. Don't I mean, worry. Then I mean, after that, that, we're going to talk about how we can improve this movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's the part you're going to probably yeah, not yeah, want to be sticking out. Uh, well, because as, as we said, so much of it is like legend. There is a question of how many of these alternate Prince starting legend, with Rocky. Chris. People being considered were Italian-American actor Ryan O'Neal, <laughs> Robert Redford. Redford. Philly underdog Robert Redford. <laughs> that would have been amazing. I mean, oh, I mean, are you been... kidding? I I mean, I was laughing thinking of all of these. There's no these way that in 1976 like, else... they were considering no. Robert Redford for Rocky. Yeah, I mean, so they so they said uh, Robert <laughs> Ryan O'Neill, Burt Reynolds, James Caan. I, I, you know, I mean, James Caan is. In, oh, oh, yeah. Let's say this, Paul. I think we can have this conversation <laughs> yes. without insulting the legacy of Rocky. <laughs> it is interesting to think about because it's not. This is not news. What I'm about to say. Sly Stallone, I mean, he, he can't act. He has a lot of charms and abilities, but acting, the, the technical ability to act is not one of them. That's not why he's a star. How dare you? It is interesting to think about, is there anyone who could have played Rocky that, like a James Caan, yeah. who is an actor, but has that sort of feral street vibe? Yeah. It's not Burt Reynolds, I don't think. No, no. Uh, no, because he played with too much of a smirk, probably, like yeah. he did with everything. James Caan, I think, has the, like you said, the street yeah. Credibility, the the toughness, all that stuff. Could he do the vulnerability that yeah. that Stallone did? I don't know, but we wouldn't have thought probably yeah. Stallone looking back would have had He can do wounded, that, you know. He can do wounded muscular vulnerability, but I don't think he can be as funny with the turtles yeah. and the Yeah. The pet shop stuff. I'm not sure. That's the, a weird combination to have in an actor that can do both of these things. Right. Yeah, even James Conn with the women, like with 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 uh, with Adrian, seems like yeah. it would be a very tough He's thing. He's too for much him a to, Casanova. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Too many years living in the uh, Playboy Mansion. Yeah. For, uh, well, with uh, just with Sylvester Stallone, you know, one of the things, you know, not only is he so much bigger than than these guys, like because I can't think of any of these guys with like that you kind mean physically of physically bigger, physically bigger. Yeah. Uh, James Conn was a pretty had a pretty good yeah. physique. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm sure they were all very handsome naked. But he was I just covered like... in a very distracting pelt. <laughs> if you ever seen James Conner's yeah, shirt off, was, yeah, it's yeah, really it's weird. He's gonna. Well, pelt. the Godfather, he has like suspenders on him. Yes. Where that the shoulder, they're yeah. just like that's it's holding the hair. Her shoulder. Is... What about Travolta? A year later, Travolta's in another movie that takes a ethnic underclass and puts it up on the big screen. Travolta could do all that romantic, wounded stuff. He doesn't feel believable as an athlete of any kind. No, to he's, me. A, he's a dancer. Great yeah. dancer. He's got to dance. Great dancer. He has got to dance. dance. He's got to dance. But what That's if Rocky true. in the, you know, starts boxing but then his thing is like a really well executed pirouette. Then we <laughs> just would to throw not, we would not Apollo be talking off. about it now. You almost can't name anyone who could do it, which is weird. Well, we have yet to name anyone who I think would plausibly well, be Well, yeah, Rocky. the only other person who pulled off, well not the only person, but the big one obviously was uh De Niro and Raging Bull has all the boxing stuff down, mm-hmm. the brutishness, yes. but he was, you know, he, it's he just a monster a of a character. Yeah. Um, so I That's couldn't imagine him being thing. delicate with that either. So, yeah, I don't know. I couldn't think of anyone who, who could. Who the hell else could do it? In well, I guess the last might have been the only other person that I read uh, who claims he was offered the lead role, which was Warren Beatty. Ugh. Shirley MacLaine would have been better than Warren Beatty <laughs> in this role. Well, because she has boxing chops from sure. a previous life. <gasps> I'm trying to think who's of the 70s. Not Dreyfus. No. No. Scheider would have done it. Yeah, that's a Scheider. He was a boxer. I could see Scheider. He was an actual boxer. You know, I could have said that. Scheider in 76. That's Jaws era Scheider. He's a little old. He's he's the the closest so far. that This movie is so much about being old. Yeah. I mean, that's what he keeps saying. Past it. For being past it, yeah, yeah. And yet, the thing about Stallone that he brings to it, besides his weird looking face and the Mm -hmm. weird speech and stuff like that, is there is like that youthful vulnerability on top of that's true of all that like despite being past it despite everybody saying what he is you know there is still something vibrant and childlike about him you know who could have done the romance part it could have been believable in the boxing stuff wasn't a boxing movie but is not at all right for the philadelphia part is paul newman but he couldn't do the philly arm breaking part he was in uh somebody up there likes me somebody up there likes me i also keep thinking like somebody who's like got some bulk in the same way that uh how about yeah, Nicholson? Does. Hmm. The hard part of having with all those guys, very few of them have that the vulnerability, or at least I haven't seen it or can think of a film where I've seen them, them deliver that. They're also huge movie stars, so it's hard yeah, to think yeah, of them right, being exactly. the underdog. Yeah, yeah. Harvey Keitel could have done it. You mean done Rocky? Could have done Rocky, yeah. Young Harvey Keitel? Yeah. He could have so. done you know, it. He also, he, he strikes done me it. as more of like, a, again, like an underdog. There's, yeah. He's not I the I can picture him being a boxer for some reason. Like, no, yeah, I can see him Mean Streets, Harvey Keitel. Like, but again, there's, it, it's like to give Stallone his due. It's Absolutely. a real 100%. thing that no one else had. And he wrote to it. What will show me off of this? What yeah. can I do that no else He's not graceful, can. so make him a brawler. Don't make yeah. him some guy who dances around. He's Who's the guy they wanted for... Mick, who was annoyed he had to audition. I read that that's, bunch how Bur- of people. that's how Burgess got it. It was like, Lee Strasberg? Oh, yeah, uh, Strasberg. That's Hyman Roth. Turned, turned Hyman Roth would have been a great, <laughs> also, he would have been a great Mick. He had just had, because of the Godfather movie, yeah. he was a little bit hot, and so he sure, was asking right. for a lot. They catch him a year or two My number just later. <laughs> My number just <laughs> like, uh, but I didn't Lee- ask how much. <laughs> this <laughs> is strictly <laughs> business. You can't improve upon Burgess know, Meredith's yeah. watery-eyed, like, left-behind possibility. There's just no better choice. No way. How yeah. old was he? But how, how old was, was Burgess Meredith? I feel like I'm starting to watch movies now, and I'm starting to realize these people, I'm starting to get a lot closer. He was born in the 90s. Did Burgess get nominated for this? He had to write the yeah, he did. Best Supporting Actor nominee. Who won, who won that? He year? did. Uh, and it was split with Burt Young. Oh, he got nominated too. Oh, they both. Wow. Uh, let's, Best Supporting Actor uh, Burt was Young, in 1977. Had to be someone from Network or something, I would think. Jason Robards for All the Presidents. Oh, all the presidents. oh, oh that's right. Together. Actually, Jason Robards could have done Rocky. <laughs> uh, yeah, he won. But that's He was the winner of that one. I've watched a few Burt Young movies, like The Gang That Couldn't Shoot Straight, uh, uh-huh. Across 110th Street. Still going. Let me see how many credits he has. His uh, that picture of him in the Navy is uh, from a movie. Oh, was it really? That's right. Yeah. The movie he made before this. Yes. That's a guy who's like, someone somewhere put him in a movie once, and they're just like, okay, this this is a, just keep a archetype <laughs> that we need in movies constantly. The first line he has in Rocky, he's in the bathroom. He looks at the mirror. He goes, who cracked this mirror? I can split the head with a freaking razor. He said, that's the first <laughs> thing he says in the movie. Like, what? That is such uh, and he's just really not a hellscape. <laughs> He just walked that's, by people warming themselves yeah. and singing over a garbage can. There's also like got to be a cold sore epidemic. Yeah. Between the amount of like cigarettes and it was the uh, 70s, beer yeah. bottles yeah. and everything yeah. just passing Taking around back. each other. Mm, do, 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 do. <laughs> For Adrian, 
That it was originally mm. offered to carry Snodgrass, who we didn't talk about in the Fury because we didn't talk about the Fury. Right. But she was good. Uh, she was she a was, star at the time. She wanted too much money. I uh, believe. But wanted too much money. Then Susan Sarandon auditioned, but they uh, too pretty, too yeah. obviously attractive. That was their thought. And too Cher pretty. was considered, which I thought was interesting because we had done Moonstruck a little while ago, and Cher is just a wonderful actor. And I think actually she probably could have done this really well. Yeah, but too pretty too. I mean, too sure. striking looking. Yeah, I mean, look, she seems too exotic or I something. Talia Shire is pretty beautiful, too. It's like they 100%. definitely are trying to make yeah. her not look as pretty as she is. You can hide it with the hat and the glasses and the haircut. And then I yep. just think Cher can do like anything. Cher can do anything. She I think she's she such a fantastic She's very ex- almost like too exotic looking or something. Mm-hmm. But like, then in that not, scene where so... Rocky's like confessing the night before all his fears, she just goes, snap out of it. <laughs> <laughs> This is not exactly alternative casting. This is the other side of it. You know, with this, Sylvester Stallone became huge. Mm -hmm. This was the highest grossing film of 76. The highest grossing film of 77 was Star Wars. Wars. Mm -hmm. And so Stallone auditioned for Han Solo. (laughs) Uh, Which I thought was interesting. Is there tape? Alongside Chevy Chase, Bill Murray, and John Travolta. Sure. Who also auditioned for Han Solo. Those all have made the franchise much more interesting. (laughs) (laughs) Travolta also. Yeah, we didn't talk too much about Carl Weathers, like you said. Except he does a fantastic job it's with a, with a really interesting role, and he's you know he's done some great work he's since. Awesome then. in the Mandalorian, yeah. Action Jackson was uh, the franchise. Action Jackson, Jackson yeah, that was a lot of fun. Predator. He's worked a lot, and he was in uh, Arrested Development. Another oh, he's Arrested amazing. Development. Arrested Development. Great, funny, self aware, yeah, uh, strange sort of cameo. Yeah, though he was not the first choice necessarily. They originally wanted an actual boxer. Yes, Kenny Norton was offered the mm-hmm. role, yeah. but because he was. 230 pounds, yes. he would dwarf uh, he would Stallone, Rocky. I guess, 50, him, uh, yeah, yeah. 50 pounds. Right. And, and I think a lot of um, a lot of Apollo Creed's stuff, wasn't it taken from not Muhammad Ali, whose fight with Bayonne Bleeder, uh, what's his name? Chuck, Chuck Webner. Webner. Chuck Webner was the inspiration mm-hmm. for this story. And I think Stallone actually had to pay a yeah, settlement he, to right. Webner because he Stallone admitted, made like that. Like in interviews, like, yeah, I saw the fight. Yeah, don't ever say that. Yeah, Aspiring yeah. screenwriters, right. don't ever tell the origin story. <laughs> Because now you got to go license, right. you got to pay Chuck Webner several million dollars, I'm sure. Yeah. I think it was Joe Frazier that he took some of the um, some of the Apollo stuff uh-huh. from. In Rocky Three, Ernie Shavers tried out for Clubber Lang. Stallone, again, at that point where you're starting to believe the myth. Yeah. Mm. Come on, don't pull any punches on me. And Ernie Shavers <laughs> like, really, Are I just sure? can't, I can't <laughs> do that. Finally, he kept like goading him and going, he's like, all right, I'm going to give you just like one, hits him below the ribs. Oh. Stallone just goes straight <laughs> to the bathroom, started <laughs> vomiting and says, I like, get him out of here. <laughs> and Ernie Shavers says, I guess I didn't get the Part. Conversely, Carl Weathers, in his audition, he was sparring with Stallone and accidentally punched him on the chin. This is what I'm getting from IMDb. Okay. Stallone told Weathers to calm down. It was only on audition. And Weathers said that if he was allowed to audition with a real actor, not a stand-in, <laughs> he'd be able to do a lot better. That's amazing. That's right. The director then told Weathers that Stallone was the real actor <laughs> and the writer. Weathers looked at Stallone thoughtfully for a moment and said, well, maybe he'll get better. <laughs> and Stallone immediately offered them the role. Another about Stallone getting punched. Dolph Lundgren put him in the hospital. <laughs> yeah, he oh, yeah. Hospital. He's like, hey, treat it for real. Like, really? <laughs> After that, he's like, all right, guys, it's just, a, it's just a movie shoot. The only actual actor who I saw that auditioned for the role of Apollo as well is Roger Mosley from Magnum P.I. Oh, DC. DC, yeah. Carl Weathers played in the NFL. Like, yeah. Earlier, right? that was he also he yeah. played with Fred Dreyer, yes. who then went on to star in Hunter. You know, yeah. Super athletic guy, clearly. Yeah. You know, He also must be extremely personable. You don't have that type of longevity. If you look at his IMDb page, he's been on a bunch of long-running TV series. You can't be an asshole and get yeah, employed that long. If, if you're not the lead star where you can be you know, whatever kind of jerk you want to be and get yeah. away with it. Chris, I have two Columbo Cinematic Universe mentions. Columbo Cinematic Universe. Ah, one more thing. So Thayer David, who plays the promoter, he was in a Columbo called Now You See Him. Now You See Him was with Columbo scenery chewer Jack Cassidy (laughs) as a stage illusionist killing his employer and making it look like a contract killing. That's the best. Uh, And so Thayer David, who is the promoter in Rocky, is in that. And Burt Young was in the 1994, which to me, I don't consider that Columbo canon. That's too late (laughs) for what I'm interested in. Uh, But Burt Young was in an episode of Columbo called Undercover, which he co-starred with Ed Begley Jr., Ooh, that's quite a cast. Is it? Yeah. Ed I mean, Bailey Jr., I mean, he classes up anything he does. Well, you'll like this. This is your kind of Columbo plot, Chris. Lieutenant Columbo investigates men and women who are being killed over pieces of a photo they have. 
Oh, yeah. Oh. The photos, when assembled, show where $4 million in stolen money is hidden. Oh, Why didn't just, they just one leave one it as one photo. Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand. I think that your signature openings get appropriate amount of attention. I don't think, however, that your signature endings get enough. I think we need to center them in the narrative of the podcast. So I'll cut it back into the center. What Chris does is he plays the last line of dialogue from a famous or infamous or known or slightly well-known film. And what we want you to do is be first to figure out what it was. When the episode goes up, we'll put up a image from the film that you're talking about that doesn't give it away. And we will say, who can identify? Identify Chris's final line from this week's episode. Oh, I love that. And we'll do I that think on, that's great. Do that on Facebook. Facebook finally has a reason for being. Would you like to move on to our next segment? Yes. Okay, Paul, this is a segment called Latchkey TV. Hello? Did you watch TV a lot as a kid growing up? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. My parents were very... Neglect <laughs> <Excellent. laughs> Well, that's why we're all here. Since Rocky is such a masculine enterprise, even though, as we've said, it's really a love story, it's, it's a universal story. You know, women out there who've turned their noses up at Rocky, just remember, Adrian, it's all about Adrian. I thought we would celebrate some of 1976's most successful TV shows featuring and about women. So we're just going to play a few iconic theme songs here, um, and we're going to talk about Charlie's Angels. Once upon a time, there were three little girls who went to the police academy. <laughs> and they were each assigned very hazardous duties. But I took them away from all that, and now they work for me. My name is Charlie. confused in all Charlie Angels like which one's Charlie and then which one's the other guy like Charlie you never see and that's uh what's his name uh John Forsythe, John Forsythe. Right? Yeah. but Dave Doyle is the other what's his Bosley Bosley yeah, he's like yeah. the office man it's a little yeah. too if I was an executive I'd just taken out one layer of that yeah well this yeah. is the 70s they, yeah. they get money to burn how about a fourth angel instead of Bosley can we get one more iconic Bosley? opening the that graphics of that opening. that's influential yeah. that's a kick-ass theme song Written by Jack Elliott, who also wrote the themes for Night Court and co-wrote the themes to Barney Miller with Alan Ferguson. That's, That's great. Pretty, wow. pretty fucking great. So that was a big hit in 1976, as was this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Schlemiel, Schlemizel, Hasenbemper Incorporated. Keep smiling. <laughs> we won't try. Never heard the word what impossible. <laughs> Big ragu. There's no stopping us. We're gonna do it. On your mark, get set, and go now. Got a dream and we just know now. We're gonna make it. Do you mind the B-roll they used to shoot too for oh those 70s God. intros? Like, look at all the shit. That's an amazing song. That is a great song. That is a great song. That's written by Charles Fox, who also wrote the theme for The Love Boat. I thought it was Paul Williams that did the theme for The Love Boat. It says wrote the theme song for the series The Love Boat. Maybe Paul Williams. And the dramatic theme music to Wide World of Sports and the original Monday Night Football theme. And Charles Fox also wrote Killing Me Softly. No kidding. Phoebe Snow hit. And you know who performed that? The Laverne Uh, and Shirley theme? Cindy Williams and... uh, No. What's her... What's her face? 
What is her face? Penny Marshall. Penny Marshall. Cindy Williams and Penny Marshall. Yeah. Jeez, I think she does a little more credit than what's her face. <laughs> I just, iconic I <laughs> television and film. Yeah, Dr- director, actor, Penny Marshall. Yeah, if you want credit, you can listen to our episode about League of Their Own uh, yeah. and see who's the one giving her credit. <laughs> one hit wonder Cindy Greco sang the Laverne and Shirley theme song. Now, here's one close to my heart. If you grew up like I did in a home broken through divorce, you loved this song. Cue a child crying. <laughs> a lot of TV watching by yourself, <laughs> you know. Early to rise, early to bed. Between I cooked and cleaned and went out of my head Going through life with blinders on It's tough to see I had to get up, get out from under And look for me There's a new girl in town And she's looking good There's a fresh freckle forgotten how great that theme song is. Music by David Shire. David Shire, who was originally supposed to compose uh, the Rocky music. That's right. Oh, uh, But that's then correct. he had a conflict. Yeah. Maybe with that's this. Right else. That's also one of the few examples of the theme song to a show being sung by the star. Of course. And Linda right. Lavin did a I was great ask, vocal performance. Because Linda Lavin, of course, yeah. is she's a got Broadway chops. baby. Yep. You can hear the chops. Broadway chops. You can also see in the stuff that they filmed just for this, the like, yes. <laughs> stagey, hokey stuff, she makes, they look like real scenes. Like yeah, yeah. she yeah. actually yeah. has stuff yeah. going on. Absolutely. That was such a huge show for me growing up. Okay, the last one I'm going to play for you is, of course, this one. Wow. One of my favorite shows of all time. The B-roll that they shot. Yeah. I mean, two frames of her at the supermarket. Yes. <laughs> Mildly of setup. displeased with the pork chop selection. <laughs> <laughs> One week of shooting. Yeah. This huge push in to an <laughs> office building across the street. It's like, yeah, look, she's out of the shoot. Well, you know, second units are helmed by everyone who wants to be a real film director, so they're going to go for it. Great point. I love this show. Ted Knight. So great. What a this great is one cast. of the great TV shows of all time. Totally agree. Interesting thing about the Mary Tyler Moore theme song. It was written by Sonny Curtis, hmm. who wrote I Fought the Law. Oh, wow. Oh, really? Matt, the engineer, you can cut in a little bit of the Flash version. Also wrote more than I can say, which you yacht rock fans out there will know from this iconic Leo Sater cover. If you didn't skate to this during couple skate <laughs> at your roller rink, you did not grow up you in the seventies. I don't know where you were growing up. I went down to Leo Sayer rabbit hole because I was like, "How did Leo Sayer become famous? Like a five foot four, a guy with a voice higher than a chipmunk." And he was a massive star for a while. So that's Sonny that's Curtis. A, wow. So anyway, I just I thought that would show. give us a little something else. Two other quick things we're going to do. One is we got another voicemail from our voicemail line where you can call the pod. And you can rant, you can rave, you can leave a leave a leave a 
leave off. You can leave you off can a leave message off of praise. You what you meant to say. And we have a call from one of our super listeners, Frazier, who is responsible for Chris and I watching The Fury before we switched to a much the better De Palma movie. So anyway, he left us a message, I believe, to apologize. He also has another recommendation. Hello, attempted super fan Fraser Rice here. Uh, I have a suggestion for a movie. Uh, the last one that I co-opted didn't go over so well. That was The Fury and got shunted aside for something else. My next one is 1987's The Hidden, starring Michael Nouri and Kyle MacLachlan. Uh, it's an interesting sort of sci-fi adventure horror movie uh, that I think is graphically overlooked. And uh, I think that'd be a good one for the for the podcast. Uh, again, I'm 0 for 1 in suggestions, so hopefully I'm not 0 for 2. Take care. Bye. This is the movie that Frazier suggested. I thought we'd just watch a little of the trailer because I don't think I've ever even heard of this movie. Holy shit. This movie's awesome. You know this movie? Yeah. Um, this is similar to it's not similar. Other... It, it's its own kind of great. Okay, well, listen, just easy. God, we haven't even played the trailer yet. Chris is getting all. I think you struck a chord, Frazier. Oh wait, I'm thinking of a different movie. I want this car. Jonathan Miller would never do anything to break the law. I need the keys. Sure, you're talking about the same Thank movie, Chris? Bye. He is a very fine, very honest gentleman. Something so far, pretty so awesome. <laughs> to some ordinary people. So yeah, ordinary people fair. are going nuts, nice committing man. crimes. We, we don't do know why. Driving sports cars through San Francisco. Running over guys in wheelchairs. Twelve people wounded. Twenty-three more stole six cars. Most of them Ferraris. If anybody deserves to go down, most of them Ferraris. <laughs> Homicide for 13 years. Now. I have never seen anything like this. Hello. Shifted gears. You trying to tell me that she's part of this? Step out of the car slow. Stripper with a machine gun, guys. I want answers, and I want them now. Explanation won't help you. I want to know why it takes 15 shots to take down some sold-out stripper. Why three law-abiding citizens all of a sudden go crazy and start killing people? Are we talking spacemen here? Something gets in his way. Starring Nick Hurley from Flashdance, everyone. Michael Murray. Finds a body. Gets inside. Uses it to move around. Try for one on the tire. Do you think this is easy? Why don't you try it? Kyle McLaughlin. a career in the police didn't really prepare you for this, did it? It's so good! That's The Hidden. So that's like one of those movies where kind of like The Thing, there's an organism that slips between people. So, so yeah, but in an urban environment that, and it came from outer space and I think they even say in the trailer. Well, this is directed by the great Jack Shoulder. That's a made-up director name if I ever heard of one. I don't know who Jack Shoulder is. He's got is, a shoulder the burden. I thought he, that was shoulder. He directed uh, Wishmaster 2. He directed a lot of sequels to better-known movies like <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street 2. He also directed Arachnid, which I sort of remember being good. I don't know, Fraser, if we're going to watch The Hidden. What do you think? I mean... I would love it. I remember loving this movie. Now, the trailer doesn't do it justice in the sense that the, like, fun music. Like, mm. I remember being a, a sort of scarier, Was that Danger Zone? Burn. Was that cut to Danger Zone? It was Danger well, Zone-esque, but it wasn't. Well, was it uh, say, wasn't the real, it's wasn't the non-union, yeah. uh, you know, cheap equivalent of Danger yeah. Zone. Yeah. You're saying the movie's better than that trailer? You're saying that's <laughs> underselling it? The trailer's pretty damn good. Why? It that depends on what you want. Yeah. I, I think it comes down to Frazier's credibility as a film suggestor. <laughs> if we do watch this... The Fury has a lot going for it as a whacked out De Palma movie, but it doesn't have quite as much whacked out De Palma-ness as we were after. Right. So we had to move in midstream to a film that gave us more of what we wanted, which was Phantom of the Paradise. However, sure. you know, I think yeah, that has more to do with what we wanted as opposed to what was true, you know. So if but I'm just saying, is Frazier willing to put everything on the line for us to watch The Hidden and po like if he's over two, there's no there, there's no coming back from that. Right. Yeah. But if he's one for one, it's like, OK, the guy's got some taste. So I'm willing to watch it. Uh, and then we can discuss whether it was worthy of inclusion on a forthcoming episode. That, per that sounds perfect. Um, the only other thing I want to leave you with is we got a nice uh, review from a super listener named Jeffrey D. Stevens. He was kind enough to leave us a review of the pod. And then we replied and then he replied and then we replied and then he replied. Crazy story. 
He's a guy who's worked in the movies for 29 years, and he has one of the more interesting credits that I've seen. He is a set medic on major motion pictures and TV shows, and he has worked on a shit ton of cool stuff over the years. And I said, you know what? You're so kind and such a loyal listener. You should tell us a movie that you want us to do. Before I get to the movie that he asked us to do, I just want to run through a few of his credits because were I to talk to Jeffrey D. Stevens, I would geek out (laughs) over... Candyman, which we did on the pod, yes. but he also worked on Master and Commander, one of my all-time favorite movies starring Russell Crowe. I would definitely love to hear about being an on-set medic on any Russell Crowe movie. He worked on Chud 2. Well, I love Chud, the Chud. One, which had uh, John Hurd in it. Yes. Patriot Games, Last Action Hero. Dante's Peak, Last Man Standing. Cindy Crawford, Next Challenge Workout. I'm sure there was a lot of on-set medicing required <laughs> for that one. So he suggested seven. We've talked about doing a Fincher, and this may be the opportunity to do one because I think Seven is a movie we all remember. It was so different and strange in 1995, which is insane. Do you like what you do for a living? These things you see? You have to wear blinders sometimes. Most times. Detective William Somerset is looking for a way out. You're retiring. Six more days and you're all the way gone. So how long have you lived here? Too long. Detective David Mills is looking for a way in. We'll be spending every waking hour together from now until the time I leave. I'll show you who your friends and enemies are. Look, I'm going to come inside five years. Not here. Now, is he to we have ourselves a homicide? They're caught in a game. No fingerprints. No witnesses of any kind. Nope. Where the price of sin is death. There are seven deadly sins. Gluttony. You're going to come take a look at this. Greed. No one touches anything. Sloth, wrath, pride, lust, and envy. Seven. You can expect five more of these. Body was found on Tuesday morning. I hate this city. This guy's methodical, exacting, and worst of all, patient. He's laughing at us. He had a gun. <laughs> Let's finish it. Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman, Gwyneth Paltrow. Have you ever seen anything like this? No. Seven. Dad. Is pretty awesome. I'm ready to jump into seven. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, for suggesting that. Jeffrey also says that every set that he's on, he talks up the pod. So we're going to do seven for you, Jeffrey. Which we'll record next week. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Paul, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I was going to talk about Rocky for two hours with someone today. uh, (laughs) You can go talk to yourself about it at your desk all you want. Absolutely. No, you guys are great. Thanks a lot. You rushed out to bullet on that one. Yo, Adrian. (laughs) 